this program. Yep, there we go. And uh, we're so happy to have Sarah Wasberg Johnson with us tonight, otherwise known as the food historian. She's fabulous. We're always so happy when she's here. And tonight she's doing a program entitled When the Groom Had His Own Cake, America's Wedding Food Tradition. So I'm going to hand it over to Sarah. Sarah's going to be back in um, June. We were just talking about it. So um, you can also join us then if you'd like. I'll hand it over to you, Sarah. Hey, Catherine. Just go ahead and share my screen. So bear with me a second here. Bring out my PowerPoint. <laughs> All righty. So let me get situated. All right. So thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, if you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat as we go. I'll ask Catherine to kind of keep her eye on it. Because if I keep my eye on the chat, I get totally derailed and forget what they're talking about. Um, and then if anybody has questions at the end, I'm happy to answer questions, um, as many questions as you have. So uh, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. This one is called When the Groom Had His Own Cake, Food and Wedding Traditions in America. We're going to talk about the 1850s to today. So it'll be a little bit of a whirlwind tour of wedding food traditions um, and wedding traditions actually more generally uh, throughout American history. So let me just make sure I can, yes. All right, so I said 1850 today, but we're gonna talk a little bit about weddings before 1850 just to give us some context. Um, so generally the wedding ceremony was either in the home of the bride or in the minister's home. Um, the attendance was generally family only uh, and then you would have a wedding breakfast afterwards. And it's called a wedding breakfast um, because of medieval morning mass ceremonies, right? So you'd have morning mass, which is where you would get married. Um, and then afterwards you would have a breakfast after morning mass. Um, by the time you get to the early 19th century, a wedding breakfast is pretty much the norm for weddings um, hosted again in the family home with food made by the women of the family. Hopefully not the bride, but you never know. <laughs> uh, and it was pretty small, pretty low key. And then also sometimes there's no food, just cake, which is a tradition that persists, which we'll talk about as we go. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about some of the signs of the times, right? That have put weddings in historical context. Uh, so in the 1840s through the 1860s, this is a very fashion plate wedding, right? Um, very influenced by Queen Victoria's 1841 wedding. And I think people forget that the Victorian era actually starts in the 1840s. <laughs> you know, we tend to think of it as like, you know, maybe 1860s, 1870s, but it actually starts in the 1840s. Um, Queen Victoria popularizes both white dresses and the use of orange blossom. Uh, white dresses were not particularly common um, as wedding attire. They weren't uncommon, but that was not the norm. Um, most people just wore whatever, you know, fancy dress they had, or they had something made, um, but they would maybe wear it again later, depending on your socioeconomic status, right? Um, and then orange blossoms in, in your hair or carried were also popularized by Queen Victoria. Um, however, weddings and wedding receptions were still mostly hosted in the home, um, and not necessarily in any public venue. Uh, and again, the focus is on the immediate family. As we get into the 1870s through the 1900s, this is like the late Victorian and into the Gilded Age. Um, weddings and receptions move more into the public sphere. Uh, you start to have big, more public events. You have big church weddings. Um, you have uh, receptions where you're inviting like everybody you know, right? It's not just the immediate family. Um, in the Gilded Age, of course, incredibly lavish wedding receptions uh, become very popular kind of fodder for society papers, right? <laughs> so funny, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, and then we get to the First World War and we start to have a couple of changes. Uh, we're only in the war for like a year and a half, um, but voluntary rationing does kind of affect the menu. Um, Herbert Hoover was the United States food administrator throughout World War I, um, and we had voluntary, not mandatory, voluntary rationing of wheat sugar, 
meat uh, and fats, particularly animal fats like butter and lard. Um, and because it was voluntary and kind of performative in some ways, although there was also a lot of peer pressure to, to conform, um, this mostly affected middle and upper middle class um, weddings because you know, you're having your lavish public wedding, but it's wartime, so it can't be too lavish and you're trying to conform to these kind of societal ideas of what's acceptable, and that includes voluntary rationing. You also get the tradition of war brides. Um, and this is not really something that's particularly used in prior wars, you know, like get married before the man gets shipped off. And that's because most of the wars, um, with the possible exception of the Spanish American War, um, all took place on American soil, <laughs> right, prior to this. Um, but this is the thing that happens. We have this nice uh, image here of basically a war bride. There's some man in his uniform and the woman in her wedding dress and they're getting married before he goes off to war. This is from World War I. Um, and I thought this is a cartoon, a uh, political cartoon. Um, and it's the best man coming into this uh, wedding or wedding ceremony. And he says, hooray, I've got written permission from the food controller to throw, it's covered up on my screen too, I think it says like four grains of rice. Um, and so that's a joke, the food controller being Herbert Hoover, um, that you had to like get permission to waste food, uh, throwing rice for, for the end of the wedding, right? Which is a stereotypical tradition in the late 19th and early 20th century. So. I cracked up the first time I saw this because I study World War I a lot. Um, and it's just a, I thought it was just a funny joke. And then of course it looks like there's the, the, the father of the bride, I assume in the back is like, hooray, you got permission. It's just a cute image. But it also illustrates, this is a society wedding, right? The men are in tails and there's flowers and, potted plants everywhere. Everybody's got huge bouquets, right? Even the mother of the bride has this giant like arm corsage. So this is a wealthy wedding. All right, as we get into the 1920s, you do start to see more receptions outside the home. Um, this is not an uncommon trend from the 1870s, really. 1860s, 1870s is when this starts, but it's mostly relegated to like um, wealthier weddings, or if you have a very large family and not a big enough home, <laughs> you would have some outside of the home receptions, but it becomes more and more common in the 1920s. Um, you start to have dancing at wedding receptions, which was not common um, prior to the 1920s. Uh, prohibition also plays a role in whether or not you can have alcohol. Because, of course, traditionally there's champagne and wine and all kinds of alcohol flowing at weddings, and that doesn't happen so much during Prohibition. Um, and this is just a great thing from Emily Post about Prohibition. This is from 1922, Etiquette Book of Hers. Uh, and she says, there used, to always be, there used always to be champagne. A substitute is at best a poor thing, and what the prevailing one is to be is not yet determined. Orange juice and ginger ale or white grape juice and ginger ale with sugar and mint leaves are two attempts at a satisfying cup that have been offered lately. So here she's like poo-pooing that we can't have champagne anymore because of prohibition. But you know, people are trying to come up with alternatives that were sort of similar and still had that same kind of vibe um, for celebratory events like weddings. During the Great Depression, um, it really depends on where you are and what your socioeconomic status is. This is an image of a wedding from the 1930s um, that looks as lavish as just about any other wedding. Maybe the cake is a little smaller. Um, Prohibition was repealed in 1933, so that has a big impact. Lots more alcohol is available. Uh, and like I said, this image is from the 1930s, 1935. You can see another trend is the matching bridesmaids dresses there. <laughs> Um, which was not also not always the case. Um, but for as far as I can tell, there wasn't a huge impact on wedding receptions. Um, again, unless you were very poor, in which case you probably wouldn't even have a wedding reception. Um, here's a couple more wasting their rice, right? We don't have to worry about 
food waste because this is, we're not in World War One or World War Two, so they're being pelted with rice. Um, World War Two, we get a lot more impact on weddings. There's this um, awesome cover image of a magazine that you can see right here. This woman in her bridal dress and her husband and looks like it's naval uniform. They're cutting it with his sword, maybe he's a marine. Um, so again, you get the return of war brides. Um, and you get cardboard wedding cake, which is what is illustrated here. So they have a dark unfrosted fruit cake and to the side, you see this little roughly white thing and that is a cardboard and paper cover. So instead of frosting, because there's sugar rationing and butter rationing, you have this fancy cover that you then take off when it's time to cut the cake. Um, you did also sometimes have these big confection looking wedding cakes uh, that were all cardboard and paper. They didn't have cake under it, uh, but I thought that was a great illustration. And again, this is because of rationing. Recognize those people, right? Very famous, Elizabeth Taylor, and I don't actually know which of her husbands. <laughs> I should have written it down. So post-war Hollywood weddings become hugely influential. There's a return to luxury like butter, sugar, fat, it all comes back in, white flour, meat. Um, like I said, there's Hollywood glamour, a lot of um, famous Hollywood weddings happen around this time. This is interesting. The median age to marry declines to its lowest rate ever between 1950 and 1980, right? So our booming post-war economy, you can get a good job straight out of high school. The median marriage age um, is quite low. And then also post-war, you get a rise of international cuisines. And that's kind of an effect of um, GIs going to Europe and also going to the Pacific. There's much more interest in like Polynesian food and French food and Italian food. Um, and these kind of foreign foods that were not necessarily as prevalent uh, among as broad a swath of the country prior to the war. 1965 to 1980, we have some pretty significant changes in weddings. So we have second wave feminism, right? Um, you got the rise of national foods and hippies, and this is just an amazing hippie wedding picture that I found. <laughs> The men with their long hair and beards and the women with their long hair and like little flower crowns, right? And their cotton dresses. Um, you have a couple of important celebrity weddings, Elvis Presley in 1967 and uh, Patricia Nixon, the daughter of President Nixon, gets married in 1971. Um, and I'll show their wedding cakes later. Uh, and so also in this time period, we have like kind of a dichotomy happening. There's like the much more relaxed um, casual wedding, which is a kind of a result of the hippie back to land movement. And then we kind of go the opposite way of like super glamorous, you know, more like disco Hollywood direction, right? The 1980s to 2000, um, weddings become much more formalized again and bigger, right? This is kind of like our analog Gilded Age <laughs> in some ways. Uh, with a rising income inequality, which continues to today. Um, and the focus is less on the family and more on the individual likes and dislikes of the bride and groom, right? So we're still having big, largely public weddings, but weddings start to reflect much more the personal interests of the bride and groom. Um, way fewer at-home weddings post 1980, lots of reception halls, hotel rentals for receptions. Um, you also have rising reception costs, right? It's, there comes to be this traditional wedding, which is not really that traditional, but the wedding industry says that it is and you have to pay a lot of money for it. And that's really starts to take off in the 1980s and continues to today. Um, cakes like this one get increasingly elaborate you have the rise of Martha Stewart being very influential in the wedding industry. Um, and then of course, we start to get a shift which really starts in like the 1960s and 70s where the reception has dancing like late into the night, there's DJs, there's pop music. Um, and it's just a very different wedding uh, than you know 50 years earlier. And then because this 
2021 and this is another 20 year cohort from the 2000s to today that trend of the wedding reflecting the uniqueness of the couple continues um you get a lot more outdoor weddings they're called rustic aesthetic right and then during the recession um and kind of after there was like this return to smaller weddings at home weddings elopement um on the one end of things and then the other end of things you have wedding loans right where people take out bank loans to pay for their giant wedding uh which is a thing that happens even today so that's kind of our overview of weddings throughout the decades and we're going to go a little bit more granular now talking about the different aspects of the wedding so we'll start out with the ceremony um from the beginning to the 1950s at home ceremonies were very common um also at churches right church weddings still very common continue to today um outdoor weddings really start in the 1910s and that's kind of a reflection of um, the arts and crafts movement and the kind of outdoors movement. And also uh, during the progressive era, beautiful natural settings were very, very popular. Um, you'll see in some of the images we're going to look at in a minute, uh, there's lots of interest in the 1910s in greenery and plants. <laughs> you see a lot of potted plants in a lot of these images. Um, professional venues start to be used in the 1860s tea rooms catering halls reception halls that starts in the 1860s um but really takes off in the mid 20th century um and then our symbols of wedding change over time uh orange blossoms i mentioned earlier being associated with Queen Victoria, she popularized them. Uh, they come to represent fertility because they bloom and fruit at the same time. So here we have this nice little uh, 1920s sheet music cover. When it's orange blossom time in Loveland, I'll be waiting at the church for you. And there's the bride with her little 1920s veil and a crown of orange blossoms. And she's got orange blossoms in her bouquet. Um, so that is something that is kind of falls out of popularity really in like the 1930s, 40s. Um, but it's in it's in style from the 1840s to the 1940s, just about. The other one is rice. We made a couple mentions, references of rice already. Um, the use of rice in wedding ceremonies dates back to Roman times. And again, it's a fertility symbol. Um, it's readopted in the late 19th century, popular to throw rice at the married couple. Um, other, you know, kind of post wedding things, tying tin cans to the back of the wagon or the car, right? Doing this sort of prank things, those are also common. But the rice is the food element uh, that makes a return. All right, now the reception um, the wedding breakfast from 1850 to 1880 uh, really depended on just kind of, I think, personal preference and also your wallet. So this is a line from the Ladies' Book of Etiquette and Manual of Politeness from 1860. And it says, wine and cake are sufficient to hand to each guest at a morning reception. So that's like the basics. You gotta have cake and punch wedding, which is something that continues really up until I would say the 1980s. Cake and punch weddings are still a thing. Um, they're less so today. Uh, you have your wedding breakfast in the home, largely. Uh, there were sit down breakfasts, really a luncheon, like that's a quote, right, for immediate family. And I should clarify that when I say wedding breakfast, it doesn't mean that we're having this at like eight o'clock in the morning. Sometimes you have wedding breakfast at like 1 p.m. But it's just called a breakfast because you have the ceremony in the morning and then you have a uh, the reception directly afterwards. Um, the wedding breakfast does start to become much more elaborate after the Civil War. Um, prior to the Civil War, like I said, it's just kind of like immediate family in the home celebrating the bride and groom. Um, Post-war, it becomes much bigger, much more public. And so here are some image examples. So this is uh, the wedding feast. This is from around 1840 to 1850, judging by the clothes. So this is the bride and groom are 
it's an interesting shot because they're in the center, right? But they are sort of like shy. They almost come across as shy in the image, right? And they're being toasted. And, you know, everybody's standing up to toast them except for grandma in the corner there. And the bench is pushed back and a, a stool has tipped over and there's people's shoes on the ground and flower girl baskets on the ground, right? But it's a pretty straightforward, small reception. Everybody's kind of crammed into the dining room, right? It's not, it's not a huge um, reception with multiple tables of lots of people. So this is fairly typical of the time period. Uh, I have a reference to Little Women because I think it's fun to talk about. So when Meg gets married, right? It says in the book, there was no display of gifts for they were already in the little house, nor there was there an elaborate breakfast, but plenty, a plentiful lunch of pink and fruit dressed with flowers. Mr. Lawrence and Aunt March shrugged and smiled at one another when water, lemonade, and coffee were found to be the only sorts of nectar which the three Hebe's carried around. So that is a reference to uh, the March family being um, temperance family, which means there was no wine, right? So the other reference in the etiquette in the 1860s is wine and cake. Nope, not this family because they are temperance uh, believers, right? So prohibitionists, so they, there's no wine. Um, and the three Hebe's, of course, uh, being Amy, Joe, and Beth are serving. So the girls are helping with the wedding work. This is another image from the 1860s, a fairly wealthy household judging by the furniture, but again, quite small, although there is a very elaborate cake in the center of the picture. And you can see the bride um, behind the cake with her, her little veil pinned at the sides over her low hair. Um, once we get into the 1880s to the 1930s, uh, you start to get the the seated breakfast, right, really a luncheon, which is what we have seen um, up until this point, uh, which could have multiple courses. If you're wealthy, they might have very French influence in the food. We'll see some menus in a little bit here. And then you also get the rise of the haha -ha rise of the standing breakfast, which is basically a buffet. Um, and Emily Post in 1922 says, whatever there is must be selected with a view to its being easily eaten with a fork while the plate is held in the other hand. So don't serve anything that requires a knife and a fork because people are gonna be standing around or sitting on a chair with their plate balanced on their knee, right? So that's her advice for, for the standing breakfast, which again is basically just a buffet, it's not a plated and served um, meal. And then you do start to get a uh, prevalence of luncheon for morning weddings. They're no longer called breakfast. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're luncheons. It's just a matter of semantics, um, but it's not actually breakfast food for any of us really. And then when you have an afternoon wedding, it's followed by a tea. Uh, so we don't really have like evening dinner receptions, um, except for some of the very wealthy who normally hold later hours anyway. Uh, but for most people, you're either gonna have a breakfast or a luncheon with your morning wedding or tea if you have an afternoon wedding. So this is a little uh, trade card for a biscuit company, but it depicts a wedding breakfast. And again, this is quite a wealthy family. They have, um, uh, I'm forgetting the word, the manservant. I'll think of it later. Anyway, they're wearing like 18th century livery. Um, and you can see the bride is standing and cutting the cake in the middle and there's all sorts of other desserts right? And some people have champagne glasses and things like that. So, and again, it's a very small group. It's obviously in somebody's home, I would assume. Maybe it's a public venue, hard to tell. Um, and then you start to get evening receptions. So they are around in the 1860s, um, but they aren't as common. So the ladies with the medicate says, let the supper be laid early and ready when the ceremony is over, that the guests may pass into the dining room if they wish as soon as they have spoken to the bride. So that is, you know, you're having the, the ceremony in the home, then there's the receiving line. And when the guests go through the receiving line, they just go right into the reception and they can start eating, right? <laughs> um, and again, they're usually held following afternoon ceremonies. They are, as I said, much more common in wealthier households than they are in 
middle and lower class households. And again, dancing is around, but not usual until the late 19th century. And it's really not the norm until after the 1950s, even through the 1920s, 30s, 40s, um, having an evening reception with dancing was not super common. This is another very elaborate image from the 1880s. Again, super wealthy. You can see that giant wedding cake in the middle there. There's champagne, there's pineapples. Um, the molded things are probably ice creams, which is very popular at the time. And you can see there's all sorts of other plates of little confections. Um, and then there's individual place settings. So this is a seated breakfast. And now we're gonna get into some menus because they're a little crazy. <laughs> so this is a wedding banquet from the British Cordon Bleu. As you can see, it's very elaborate. Very elaborate. And it's in French, everything is in French. So they start with um, black and Norwegian caviar. They have oysters, they have pâté de foie gras. Um, they have a galantine of veal head, which doesn't sound that great. Terrines, right, all different kinds of terrines. Um, May salmon with mayonnaise. Uh, what else do we have on here? Um, beef tongue, roast beef, chickens, York ham, um, pate de venison, pate of pheasant, pheasant, roasted pheasant. You know, I'm, this is just where we have pigeon. And then at the very end, we have salads. <laughs> <laughs> and then all sorts of different pastries in addition to the wedding cake, right? So this is all in addition to the wedding cake. This is from um, the Stewart's Handbook and Guide to Party Catering in Five Acts by Joseph Whitehead, published in 1889. Um, and they only get more elaborate from here. <laughs> um, this one is like a slightly less elaborate one, but still a very wealthy wedding uh, in St. Louis. And it's for 150 covers. And covers is a restaurant term meaning place setting. So this is for 150 people. Um, and again, they have consomme, they have a pate of oysters, right? Beef tenderloin with truffles. Um, and then I don't know if you can tell, they have like the wine in between each course. They start with a sauterne, there's Chateau Bouillac, then there's an Amontadillo sherry, and Roman punch, which is an alcoholic punch. Um, then you have the bride's cake in the middle, which is kind of weird. Then you have more courses and then, you know, the dessert. And it's very French because you have dessert first. Sorry, it's probably British because you have dessert first and then cheese. It's usually opposite land with French. And again, this is from Whitehead. Um, this one I find hilarious because Joseph Whitehead was like, I guess I have to include a menu for poor people. <laughs> So this is a very simple wedding breakfast. It's a restricted price of $2 per person in 1889, which was not cheap, but apparently he, he expected to be, you know, this is, oh, if you're poor, this is what you have, but it's still quite expensive, right? Another seated breakfast, this one from 1905, you can see the influence of the potted plants everywhere. But again, it's a seated breakfast. It's still quite a small group probably in someone's home and they're toasting the bride and groom, of course. Uh, and then this is one a little bit more on the middle class side, right? So here's a party of people crammed for the wedding breakfast into somebody's home. Um, but again, just it's just the cake. It's just a cake and punch uh, reception. So much simpler table arrangement. This is probably much closer to what normal people were having <laughs> for their wedding receptions. Um, this is an example from the 19 teens of sort of the changes in the types of food. So in the 1910s into the 1920s, there is this trend more towards much um, simpler menus and much more sort of naturalistic settings kind of in reaction to the excesses of the Gilded Age. Um, so this menu is uh, strawberries with nothing on them. <laughs> oh, let me click here. I got off my click. Here we go. Uh, so there's way less meat, right? It's just chicken breasts uh, and halibut. So you have a fish course and then a fowl course. 
right? And then you have fruit ices in spun sugar nests, a sort of cake spun rather than coffee. And again, that's in addition to the wedding cake. Um, this one is from Janet McKenzie Hill, 1919, Practical Cooking and Serving. And this is very seasonal because a lot of weddings happened in June, right? That's the stereotype of wedding in June or May. Um, so there's a lot of spring uh, fruits and vegetables in here. So there's strawberries, cucumbers, those are from a hot house, right? Uh, uh, not from the garden. There's peas, asparagus tips, right? Um, much lighter food than the prior one with all of its pâtés and venison and roasted vegetables. This one is from 1922, again from Emily Post, suggested seated breakfast. So you have bouillon, you have lobster Newburgh, supreme of chicken, peas, aspic of foie gras, celery salad, ice with coffee. Um, and then she gives alternatives. Instead of bouillon, there may be caviar or melon, or grapefruit, or a puree, or clam broth. For lobster Newburgh, maybe soft shell crabs, or oyster pate, or other fish. Or the bouillon may be followed by a dish such as sweetbreads and mushrooms, or a chicken pate, or a broiled chicken, or a squab with a salad. <laughs> or the chicken or squab may be the second course, and the aspic with salad the third. Individual ices are accompanied by little cakes of assorted variety, right? So lots of little things, lots of different things. Um, multiple courses, right, are still kind of the norm for the middle class and upper middle class. And then Emily Post also gives some examples of a standing breakfast, uh, which again is basically just a buffet. Um, so you'll note the all of the cold and the hot dishes are pretty easy to eat with a fork. You notice it's boned capon, right? You're not anything you need a knife to eat with. Um, and you see a couple of references to sweetbread. Sweetbreads are the thinest land of a calf. Um, and usually they're breaded and fried. Uh, and they were considered an aphrodisiac, which is why they show up so often in 19th and early 20th century um, wedding menus. So same with oysters too. Uh, and then also as we get into the 1920s and 30s, uh, ice is an ice cream, become very popular, you know, fancy dessert to serve and then coffee, right? So the changing reception. So we have catering, formal catering as early as the 1860s. Um, but by the 1920s, it becomes much more accessible to the general public. You have many more restaurants who are able to do catering. You have um, kind of reception halls that offer catering. And, you know, it's generally accepted that even if you're having a home reception, um, you're probably still going to hire a caterer to do most of the food because the food could be quite elaborate. Um, and also, you know, if it's you're the mother of the bride, you might want to actually enjoy the wedding <laughs> reception rather than being stuck in the kitchen, right? Um, so again, everything gets bigger and more public. It's interestingly, this is from Emily Post also, even though the reception is often held outside the home in the 20th century, um, she says, although it is perfectly good form to hold a wedding reception in a ballroom, a breakfast in a private house, no matter how simple, has a greater distinction than the most elaborate collation in a public establishment. Why this is so is hard to determine. It is probably that without a home atmosphere that may be a brilliant entertainment, the sentiment is missing. So I found that very interesting um, that there's still kind of this preference for the home receptions uh, for a lot of people, even at the same time as weddings are getting bigger and more elaborate. And then also Emily Post giving us great advice on catering in the home, right? All sorts of um, advice on where to put things and uh, how to keep hot foods hot and cold foods cold, right? So this is a great, I love this picture because there's very clearly people standing in a chair in the background. This is a, a home reception from about 1940. Um, and again, you can tell it's probably just cake and coffee. Um, so there are plates, larger plates there in the foreground, so there may be a buffet somewhere out of sight, um, but the cake and the, the coffee or tea service is, is right there on that central, um, central table. Oh, come on, skipped ahead. All right, so these are just a couple, we, you know, we have 
Jessup Whitehead's like very restricted menu. But by the time we get to 1940s, everything is even simpler. You know, it's basically a single course. Um, there's a whole bunch of options. You could have chicken a la king. You might have cream sweetbreads and ramekins, right? If you want to have multiple courses, or maybe if it's a seated reception, you can have bouillon in cups, right? And then slightly more elaborate. Um, but it's much less elaborate than in the 19th century. Um, so this is something that you could theoretically do at home yourself rather than having it hired out, or you might only hire out like the dessert, um, which is the thing that happened too. So you'll also notice uh, that we have bride's cake and groom's cake in all of these menus, which I'm going to explain later, but just keep that in mind. Uh, this one is from 1943. I love this one. So the caption that comes with this one says that uh, the groom was exempted from the military for essential war work. So that's why they're able to have a wedding and a wedding reception in the middle of 1943. And she's not a war bride because he does, must do some sort of essential manufacturing or government work. But um, I just love the expression on their faces. And you have a really good image of their cake. And then also like the 1910s, there's ferns everywhere. So that's kind of a holdover. Um, I don't think this is from the same wedding. It might be from the same wedding, hard to tell, but this is very clearly like a little town hall or some kind of reception hall or maybe like, you know, an Elks Lodge or something. It's not a big fancy hotel uh, setting for the wedding. So this one is from, 1943, uh, another menu, fruit cup, sweet bread, grill, right? So we got those aphrodisiac sweet breads on there. Uh, French fried potatoes, what? Grilled sweet breads and French fries? That doesn't sound like wedding food, but it was in 1943. Um, and then again, they just have wedding cake. No groom's cake on there, but we'll talk about that. The classic settlement cookbook from 1947 has a bunch of different wedding men menus. I'm not going to go super into them, but you can see um, they have one listed as breakfast and then they have multiple dinners, right? So this kind of reflects the change of, you know, the wedding reception moves later and later into the day. And then at the very bottom, they have a reception, which I think is more like a standing breakfast of a day because um, it's like open face sandwiches, chicken and sweet bread salad, right? And then, um, stuffed olives, stuffed celery, and then desserts. So it's a little bit simpler than the other ones. The Indomitable Fanny Farmer has probably the simplest wedding breakfast menu there is. I love how, so that actually a luncheon reference is from Fanny Farmer. Um, so it's just some sort of clear soup, cream lobster with rolls, strawberry parfait, black coffee, that's it. In addition to wedding. There's always wedding cake in all these menus, whether it's on the list or not. Okay, I don't know if you recognize this couple. This is uh, Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan, who basically eloped um, and just had a very tiny reception in the home. I don't remember if it's their home or the home of their friends, um, but they still have this elaborate wedding cake, which I find interesting. And you'll notice she's not wearing a traditional wedding dress. She's wearing like a wedding suit or a morning suit. Uh, which is very common from the 1930s to the 1950s. Uh, this is a wedding in Harlem at, uh, you know, like an evening club. You can see there's a stage in the back with like uh, guys with maracas painted on the walls, very tropical feel. And I love this one because they have a champagne fountain in addition to their giant buffet, and I love that the wedding cake uh, is on its own stand in front of where the bride and groom are. Um, so this is a very elaborate uh, rental from 1953, again, in Harlem. Um, I forget the name of the club, but. And then of course you probably recognize these people, right? John F. Kennedy and Jackie. Kennedy at their wed outdoor wedding reception on Cape Cod with their, looks like not a big enough cake probably for how many people were there. Um, I think I have another image, yes. And this is an example of, again, a seated reception and with the half a pineapple with the salad in it for start 
Um, that tells you how much money was involved probably in this wedding. All right, now we're gonna get to the cake. We went through all the receptions. Now it's time to talk about cake, which I'm sure is gonna be everybody's favorite. Um, I love learning with Wilder. I remember reading this as a kid and being very impressed about the beating the egg white. So obviously Lauren Goes Wilder is a good example of like a lower class, working class, more wedding. So she wears a black dress, right? Uh, and then it said, a mom made a big white cake. Laura helped her by beating the egg whites on a platter with a fork until Ma said they were stiff enough. My arm is stiffer. <laughs> um, so she's, she's having a wedding reception at home because they didn't have a big elaborate wedding because Laura was worried that her father would want to pay for it and she didn't want him to spend the money. Right. So, but they still have a white wedding cake, which is not necessarily typical for that time period. Um, because the original wedding cake was a fruit cake. So this harkens back to, again, medieval Britain um, and the gr medieval great cakes tradition, heavy on dried fruit, heavy on nuts, spices, um, molasses or honey. Um, and again, that is all because during the medieval period, all of those things had to be imported and they were all quite expensive, right? So that was the way you showed your wealth was to have all these imported dried fruits and imported nuts and spices and sugar. Um, and then in the mid 19th century, bridal cake arrives. Um, so it's a white cake made leaven first with egg whites, <laughs> like Laura is beating all those egg whites and then later you get baking soda, baking powder, things like that as chemical leaveners. Um, it's made with white flour, refined white sugar and butter. Um, and white flour, you know, the more mechanized flour production becomes, the more accessible white flour becomes, same with sugar. Um, so that is kind of a reflection of technological advancement in addition to style and taste. Uh, and so when the bridal cake arrives, then the original wedding cake becomes the groom's cake. And the groom's cake becomes a, a souvenir of weddings. So this is like, it's not atypical throughout the 19th century when you have a big public um, event that you give people something to take home, usually food. This happens also with funerals and funeral cookies that people would take as like a, a keepsake, a favor from the event. So the groom's cake, because it's a fruit cake, uh, because fruit cake keeps very well, that becomes a souvenir and the bridal cake, which does not keep very well, gets what becomes what is eaten at the reception. Souvenir cake is a thing. This is souvenir cake um, from Queen Victoria's wedding in 1840, 41. Uh, yeah, like I said, other events also had souvenir cakes or cookies. Bridal cake got eaten, groups cake got taken home. Um, this is a souvenir cake from the wedding of Tom Thumb and Lavinia Warren. It was a wedding hosted and paid for by P.T. Barnum. You had to pay to attend, uh, but you got a piece of souvenir groom's cake. And this is one that survives from 1863, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then in 1871, uh, we get the royal wedding of Princess Louise. And this is her insane cake, although most of that is not actually cake. It's on this giant stand, right? Um, so I love that this cake talks all about the decoration and nothing about what kind of cake it actually was. <laughs> I'm guessing it's a fruit cake because, you know, the British monarchy seem like traditionalists, but it doesn't really say. This one is interesting. Um, this is Woodrow Wilson's daughter's wedding cake in 1913. I find it very interesting that they put a giant vase of flowers on top. <laughs> we can see it's much simpler, much smaller, you know, very much in the style of the 1910s. There's greenery everywhere, right? Um, not this elaborate monstrosity. Granted, this is monarchy, but still, American president's daughter getting married, and that's that's the cake. So the souvenir cake continues well into the 20th century. Um, Emily Post gives advice for the black fruit cake, right? Um, 
I love this. She says, at a sit-down breakfast, the wedding cake boxes are sometimes put one at each place on the table so that each guest may be sure of receiving one and other thoughtless ones prevented from carrying away more than their fair share. <laughs> so, you know, as if you have a standing breakfast or any kind of reception line, then you would like hand somebody a box of cake as they left. Um, but I find it hilarious that she's like, don't put it in a pile because people will take more than one. Human nature, I guess. Um, all right, so this is in interesting. So this is 1941. So this is well after almost 100 years after the introduction of the white bridal cake. But uh, in the American Woman's Cookbook, the wedding cake, as you can tell from the recipe, is a fruit cake. So this is something that persists in cookbooks. You see recipes for wedding cake, and it's still a fruit cake. Um, sometimes you'll see both wedding and bridal cake or bridal and groom's cakes in the cookbooks, but often it's just wedding cake, which I find interesting. Um, this one is a couple of examples from World War II. The above is an illustration from the American Woman's Cookbook um, from 1941, so just prior to the US entrance into World War II. Um, and you can see, it says, the most exquisite creations of the clever hostess uh, are in pulled and spun sugar for bridal parties. So that's before sugar rationing. Um, and then the one at the right is from a wedding of Libby and Captain. So probably a, a war bride wedding, right, in 1943. But it still looks pretty elaborate. And I can't tell if that is actually sugar <laughs> decoration or if it's like plaster of Paris on top of another cake. It doesn't say. Um, but that's just an example of 1940s World War II era cake there. This is another very simple one in the 1940s. Uh, this one, hard to tell if it's in wartime, but it probably is. The cake is very small. Um, and the reception, it looks like it's just like bread and salads. You know, it's hard to tell. We can't see the whole table, um, but not necessarily a very elaborate wedding, right? Clearly in somebody's home, um, probably the, the family of the bride. This one is 1946. And here again, we have another wedding cake recipe that's very clearly a dark fruit cake still. Um, same with the 1950s. Wedding cake is still a dark fruit cake. Um, but we're also, I think, starting to get into, if you're not making your own wedding cake, it's probably going to be a white you know, bridal cake, right? So here's one from the 1950s. I love her little tiara with the veil. And it's a very elaborate multi-tiered cake with giant wedding bells on top. This one is from 1962. Um, it looks like it's held in a high school gym. <laughs> Hard to tell, might be a church basement. Um, but again, she's wearing her cute little satin dress, the pillbox hat and veil. And again, a very elaborate three-tiered white frosted wedding cake um, with a topper. Same with 1967. You know, we still the giant wedding bell motif. Now we have uh, some pillars, right? And of course, this is Elvis Presley's wedding uh, with seven-tiered wedding cake. But again, a little more elaborate. There's some color on there. Uh, it says Priscilla and Elvis on the top, which is very sweet. There's some more interesting decoration, uh, but still giant, still white, still multi-tiered. I love this picture. <laughs> so these people are totally unidentified, but very clearly here's the hippie bride with her hippie groom. And it's very clear who ordered the cake. Probably not them, probably the mother of the bride. It's a super traditional white multi-tiered cake with like the traditional bride and groom figure topper in a white dress and a tux. And then there's the actual bride and groom. Um, so I love this as sort of like an artifact of cultural change in the 1960s and 70s. Um, this one also from around 1970. So here we see some of the changing fashion. The bride is wearing a short wedding dress. But again, the cake is still super traditional, still white, still frosted and white. There's swans, you know, there's a little cake topper. Um, this one is Patricia Nixon's wedding cake from 1971. Again, 
not very elaborate cake itself, but the display is incredibly elaborate with multiple tiers. I don't know how they cut it, but there you go. <laughs> of course, she got married at the White House, right? Um, here's another one from the 1980s. Again, still white, still multi-tiered, still frosted with white. Um, 1989, we start to be a little bit different. We have some color on there. Right, some little purple roses. Um, I don't know if you can see it. I can't see it very well because it's so bright in here. Uh, but there is a red light up fountain underneath the cake, which just seems very late 80s to me. Um, and I think the base is also a sheet cake. Hard to tell from the picture. Um, but yes, and there's still wedding bells, still little people figures on the top. Right, the motifs haven't changed. Let me get to the 90s and something does change a little bit. We get away from buttercream and sponge sugar frosting and toward fondant. And this is very much uh, the influence of Martha Stewart here. This might even be an image from a Martha Stewart Weddings magazine. I don't remember where I got it from. Um, but much more simple, right? The frosting is smooth. It's more minimalist almost. And that kind of reflects a trend also in wedding dresses. If anybody remembers wedding dresses from the early 90s, very minimalist compared to the 1980s, um, which, you know, it's kind of interesting because the 1880s and 90s were also very elaborate. And then the 1900s and 1910s were more simple. So it's always, you know, as we're coming out of excess, we always have something of a backlash against that, right? Go the other way. And then we get into the 2000s. <laughs> And we get this trend of crazy wedding cakes that reflect the personal interests of the bride and groom. Um, this is a style of cake that I hate and that most bakers hate. And then I'm glad it's not really a style anymore. It's called a topsy-turvy cake where the, the layers are tilted, right? It's covered in fondant. It's crazy colors, it's, you know, also beach themed. <laughs> so it's just married. This is very indicative of the early 2000s of these more personalized wedding cakes. It's probably a different flavor for every layer, right? Which is another thing that happens starting in the 1990s. We start to get more interesting flavors than just white cake and white frosting. Now we get to the 2010s and this is what's called a naked cake. So it's a cake that is not frosted except for maybe in the top and in the middle. Um, so there's not frosting on the outside. And you can see very clearly this is a rustic aesthetic for this cake. Um, but also in the 20, late 20th, early 21st century, the groom's cake returns. But instead of being a fruit cake, unless your very traditional mom did the cake ordering, it's usually a chocolate cake um, or a cake that reflects the taste and preference of the groom. Um, so it's not super common and it's not a souvenir, uh, but again, it's a reflection of, um, you know, changes in tradition where the wedding is much more indicative of the individual interests of the bride and groom rather than what is the larger social or family trend and the groom's cake kind of fits into that. A lot of groom's cakes are like sports themed or like fishing and hunting, you know, something like the groom can have one tiny little slice of the wedding to himself. Um, so it does come back, but it's still not as popular and it's not usually fruitcake like it was historically. So where do we go from here? I'm not sure, but I think the, uh, the general trends of individualism <laughs> are going to continue. I think it depends very much on um, people's socioeconomic status. I think the trend of at-home weddings and elopements and things like that are going to continue because weddings are incredibly expensive um, and they can be difficult for young people or their parents to fund. I think the rustic cake trend is gonna start. I didn't even talk about the non-cake trends. I probably, should have, I probably should edit this and put some stuff in there about cupcakes because there was definitely a cupcake trend in the 2010s that kind of persists. There was a donut trend, um, having donuts instead of wedding cake. Uh, more recently, I have seen trends of cheesecakes, but they're actually, it's for people who don't like sweets, 
So it's a tiered cake made out of giant wheels of cheese, not actually cake. Um, so I think the trend is, is going to be less focused on what is the broader societal fashion and more on individual tastes and people kind of bucking tradition, which isn't really tradition in a lot of cases anyway. So I'm going to stop sharing. I see somebody dropped a comment or question in the chat. Oh, thanks, Sandy. I'm glad you liked it. Did anybody have any questions or comments? Want to share your own wedding story? <laughs> I don't know if we want to can let people unmute if they want to unmute. Yeah, you can unmute guys if anybody wants to ask any questions. I just gave you permission to unmute and put your videos on if you want. I will tell you, I did have naked cake at my wedding. I actually made, I had three wedding cakes because I like variety. Um, one of them was made by a family friend that was a more traditional with a yellow cake with like a cooked um, filling, like a creamy cooked filling with pecans. And then she made her own vanilla buttercream. That was to die for. And then I made a carrot cake with cream cheese frosting, but I didn't, I only did the top in the middle. And then I made a, a cocoa cake um, with sour cherry jam because my mm -hmm. mom loves chocolate covered cherries. And then uh, I tried and failed to stabilize whipped cream. So the whipped cream like got all melty. <laughs> <laughs> but it still tasted good so you know on my at my wedding we had a carrot cake and I think this was a trend in the 80s we had our our cake decorated with with um live with real flowers mm, yeah right like in the 80s there was a lot of that <laughs> yeah that's that's you still see that from time to time um my parents and my sister are actually florists <laughs> oh wow <laughs> so they did all the, like my sister did all the flowers for my wedding um Nice. And so she does cake toppers sometimes, yeah. but not as often as you would think, really. Yeah. <laughs> so that was my general overview of weddings and food. Did we have any questions? I didn't really talk about reception food um, that much, but you know, for seated dinners and buffets, it's it the sweet breads go away, <laughs> and like you know, it we kind of get away from like courses where everybody's eating the same thing, and instead we have you know, options you choose if you want chicken, fish, or beef, usually if it's a big hotel wedding. I did a buffet because whenever I go to a wedding, I'm like, I want a little bit of everything. <laughs> and, you know, we had stuff like uh, chicken fingers and mac and cheese and things like that. Oh, Susan, yes. Um, wedding scenes from films. Yeah, I will say films tend to which is something that happens today. Films tend to, like celebrity weddings, uh, show you the very wealthy, the very wealthy side of of weddings, particularly films in the 1990s. Like, you know, I think maybe one exception that might be Runaway Bride. Um, but even that is, you know, they're all really big. I try to have some real life versions whenever I can find them because I feel like that's more indicative of what's actually happening in in uh, the broader society, but yeah, I could I could do some be interesting to analyze the the Hollywood version next to the ordinary person version and and see if they're the same. I've been to a lot of weddings where I mean, like big weddings and catering places where they have like the the cake and they also have like a what do they call it a dessert bar where they wheel out this enormous. It's got a different name. But anyway, I think like, I know what you're talking about. I can't think of it either. Yeah, it's not a dessert bar. It's like um, a Viennese something. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. I know exactly what you're talking about, but it's like all different kinds of pastries and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, like it's overflowing. Yeah. Yeah, that I think is more common at like um, hotel weddings or reception halls yeah. where, you know, the caterer is on site. Um, I had something kind of like that because my mother-in-law wanted to make cookies for the wedding. So she made like six dozen of each kind of cookie and she made like eight different kinds of cookies. Wow. So much motivation. So that was, you know, inadvertently we were like, instead of giving groom's cake as a favorite, yeah. like, take cookies, take cookies home, everybody take cookies home. 
take a dozen home. There's yeah. an interesting question in the chat. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, Sandy, what do you think wedding is looking like when people start having it again? Good question. I actually have a couple of friends who um, postponed their weddings because of the pandemic. One was going to get married in Italy um, two years ago. <laughs> they were going to get married in the spring of, I guess it was only one year ago, spring of 2020. Um, and that didn't happen. And then they were going to get married maybe this summer. Um, but then they just went and uh, had a courthouse wedding and they're going to have a reception at a later date. And then another one of my friends is going to get married last year, pushed it back to the fall of this year, and then their wedding venue got sold out from under them. So now they're pushing it back to 2022. Um, I don't know what they'll, I don't know what they'll look like. I think it will depend on how quickly we have like a return to normalcy. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't have smaller weddings, just in general, in large part, because I think people would be continue to be concerned about COVID, you know, even as people are getting vaccinated. Um, and also because weddings are very expensive, very expensive. And a lot of people were negatively impacted economically during the pandemic. So um, you might see some kind of dialing back of that. But I think I know a number of people who just went and had courthouse weddings during the pandemic. And I don't know if they'll have receptions or not, so. I bet there'd be a lot more live streaming of weddings. You know, yeah, that would be interesting to see if that's a thing that mm -hmm. happens. Yeah, because I mean, obviously, I think in particular, as time goes on, we get more and more scattered across the country, right? People are not necessarily staying in the communities they grew up in when they become adults. Yeah. They're not necessarily marrying people from the same community that they're from. So yeah. like our wedding, uh, two thirds of our guest list was from out of state. Wow. And a couple from out of the country. So, yeah, yeah. you know, that's, that, that's an interesting question. Maybe people will live stream it. I don't know. It'd be cool. I would in watch the, a live in stream. In the 90s, there were a lot of destination weddings, like, you know, come, you know, fly to Puerto Rico, fly to Acapulco. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be interesting to see if that trend continues. Yeah. Um, you know, like my friend was going to have a destination wedding in Italy because it was cheaper to get married in Tuscany than it was to get married in Bozeman, Montana. <laughs> You know? And it was like the same distance for us to fly either way. <laughs> so yeah, I don't I don't know what the fan trail look like. It'll probably be very individualized though. I think that's the trend is people are just gonna do what they feel is best for them, not necessarily what the, the fashion is. So that and that's uh, what what Susan says in the in the chat that cupcakes are individual mini cakes are fun and nice and easy. That's the same sort of thing, like individualized, you know. Yeah, and more sanitary, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're, yeah. If there's, yeah. you know, want everybody eating from the same big cake. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kim says, were families or mother of the bride, et cetera, more in charge of the me menus and cake and receptions compared to now when you mentioned the individuality of the bride and groom, tasting sessions, sample menus nowadays, et cetera? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I think definitely because people are marrying later in life now than they used to um, and also are often, you know, already living together. So really up until the 1980s, I think most people who were getting married, unless it was your second marriage, um, did, were still living with their parents, were setting up households, you know, were still fairly young. Um, and so the, the wedding from a community standpoint was like, you know, the wedding presents and stuff would reflect that. And, you know, it was much more of a community and family event. So I think definitely historically, yes, the mother of the bride did probably have a lot more say and a lot more organizing um, in terms of what the wedding looked like, looked like and who was invited and often that's because they were paying for it. Right, whoever is paying for it really gets the say. Um, but I, yeah, I think because people are marrying later, they already have stuff. I think one of the big shifts um, is away from household gifts. Like more people are just asking for money or asking for, you know, honeymoon fund payments or or experiences instead of stuff. 
Um, and I think definitely, depending on the age um, and skill level of the bride and groom, there's there's much more individual say in in how things are done um, and what the food choices are and things like that. Yeah, because definitely, um, I mean, I'm a little bit type A, so we paid for most of our wedding ourselves. My parents helped a little bit, but we paid for most of it ourselves. And I like plan the whole thing. <laughs> but you do also have like wedding planners become a thing in I think the 1980s, right? So some people don't really care. So they kind of tell the wedding planner, this is what we like, you go take care of it. Um, but I think there is more emphasis now on, um, you know, people enjoying their weddings rather than working at their weddings, right? Depending on the size, like obviously if you're having an at-home wedding um, and people still do that if they're, if they're poor <laughs> or if they don't want a big wedding or if they're shy, like there's a lot of stuff going around about introverts not wanting big giant public weddings and they'd rather get married in their backyard at home with their friends and have like pizza and beer, you know? So that's, that's a wedding, right? But it's not the stereotypical traditional wedding. Um, but yeah, I think the, in the past when it was more public facing and community oriented, there was much more emphasis on conforming to the idea of what a wedding should be and what was in style and what was in fashion. And now people care a lot less about that kind of thing. They wanna do their own thing. Uh, okay, Susan, I still don't understand the bride and groom cakes. When was this today too? So bride and groom cakes depended on the family. Um, sometimes your wedding cake, the wedding cake was a uh, um, fruit cake, right? That's what it was made out of. It was not a white cake, but then in the mid 19th century, we get start to get um, these light white cakes with white frosting. Um, then that becomes a bridal cake. And if you have a bridal cake, then you would probably also have a fruit cake that would be called the groom's cake. So that trend kind of continues really until the mid 20th century, although I have heard from people, particularly in England, where I think that tradition holds on a lot longer, that they would still have souvenir cake like into the 80s and 90s. Um, and then around the late 90s, early 2000s, the idea of a groom's cake got revived, but it was less about the type of cake and more about reflecting the interests of the groom so that the groom had some presence mm -hmm. in the wedding because, you know, stereotypically it's all about the bride, right? That's also starting to change a little bit, um, not only because of, you know, people want more equality in their partnerships and they want that reflected in the wedding but also because we have weddings that don't have brides right or that have two brides um so that changes things a little bit too so the groom's cake had i think kind of a moment in the late 90s early 2000s it's not i don't think as popular uh anymore i think because the emphasis is more on like just the food <laughs> rather than what is this representing, you know? Um, but you do still see it occasionally that, that people will have, um, you know, one traditional white bridal cake and then either a chocolate cake uh, or a, a fruit cake. But I think more often it's just, you know, the different layers of the wedding cake are different flavors. <laughs> so, all right, any other questions for me? One's coming. Yes, multiple questions. Uh, e. Erbach says, what are people supposed to do with the sugar cake toppers after the wedding? You can wear a wedding dress again, but I inherited my grandma's cake topper from 1945, but I wouldn't use it again on another cake. Yeah, so there's all this weird, I shouldn't say weird, there's a lot of, um, you know, traditions around saving parts of the cake and saving things from weddings. I think it's totally subjective. I find it very interesting that your grandmother's cake topper was made of sugar. I assume like a molded sugar piece and they saved it, but you know, put it in a box and in 50 years you can give it to a museum <laughs> like they did with Victoria and Albert souvenir cake, right? But uh, yeah, I don't, I think it's just a nostalgia thing. Kind of like people save the, the top tier of the wedding cake and freeze it and then you're supposed to eat it on your anniversary. Um, somebody very nicely set aside the top tier of our wedding cake and then it got forgotten out overnight. <laughs> So we did save some slices of cake because we had so much cake. 
Um, so we did eat our wedding cake on our anniversary, but it was not the cake topper, um, which I find interesting. So I think that's just a souvenir thing people want to say, but um, they're not, I think a lot of cake toppers now, well, probably are plastic, but you know, there were also ceramic ones. So mine was ceramic, a little vintage one my mother-in-law found. Oh yes, okay, Kim, yes. Did you come across any American tradition of saving the top tier for eating on the first anniversary? Yes, that is definitely a thing here as well. Yep, she says it's important in Ireland. Um, there's so a lot of wedding cakes, particularly if you are ordering um, an elaborate fondant wrapped wedding cake, uh, I think are not very good tasting. <laughs> Usually, you know, the cake is made a little dry, the fondant is, you don't really want to eat the fondant, people do, but it's not really meant to be eaten. So there's, you know, some kind of fun cultural stuff about the joke is you save your wedding cake to eat on your anniversary and then it tastes terrible. <laughs> You're just kind of like, oh, why am I eating this? Um, oh yes, okay, the, her grandma's cake topper is made of royal icing in the shape of a wedding bell. Yeah, that would, that's, I can tell you from a museum perspective that archivists hate food, <laughs> historic food, because it's difficult. It's difficult to conserve. Yep, definitely keep that cool and dry if you want to save it. But like I said, I think it's just a nostalgia thing. So any other questions? I know this is a lot of conjecture. I'm sorry, there hasn't been like a serious study of, of modern weddings in academia that I've run across. There probably exists, but I haven't read it yet, so. Probably a sociology field more than a, than a history field, but. Any other questions? <laughs> All righty. I think we might be done. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> Not a question, just a comment. Well, I guess that's it. Yeah. Sarah, thank you so much. You're always just so much fun and so much information and always just a delight to have you so thank you and thank you all for joining us thank you Catherine. i enjoyed it as always sorry if it comes across as like information spew but no it's wonderful i think we have fun yeah it's very fun <laughs> <laughs> all right well good night everyone thanks for joining and um check out the library calendar there is a ton of stuff going on in june <laughs> bye good night bye good night